it working yet? Yes, yeah. it's working. Okay. I would like to uh, welcome everybody here. We have the Jerry's Group here on these hills. Well, our part is we're buying the venue. Um, to be clear, we're renting out the venue, and uh, we have to be very careful in our uh, political relationships uh, from, the, from the legal point of view. I think this is not working. We have to speak it closer, closer. Uh, yes. Anyway. Uh, it is our pleasure to, uh, to host Elizabeth Crowley today. There are a number of candidates running for borough president. And as we've seen recently, the Orthodox community can make, a, make all the difference in the outcome of a, of a local election. And we, uh, we have a very strong vested interest in who we do put up to, uh, to be our representatives here in Queens, to our Hills community, there are a number of people running for this position as borough president. And some of them are quite good, but I've felt very comfortable with this. But again, help you understand. Got to navigate this uh, carefully because we can't, as a rabbi in the community, we can't make a political endorsement. Uh, but I can say I've been very comfortable in getting to know Elizabeth for the last few years, uh, getting to greet her at other social events. And uh, this thing is really getting in the way. We don't need it. We don't need it? Okay. If everyone can come closer, that would be great. And what makes me comfortable in particular about Elizabeth, that she's straightforward, she's honest, she knows our community. When I say our community, yes, I do mean the old Fox community, but I mean as well the entire Queens community. There's a real Queens product. She knows just about every highway, byway, and side road. And I think that she will be responsive to our needs. We don't have to be worried about getting double-crossed as we have been by some of the other people we put into office. Uh, she is what she is, nothing. She will remain what she is the way we know her. She's very caring, very insightful, and the more I talk to her all the time, I see, wow, this young lady really knows a lot about what's happening right here in the Queens community. She'll surely be a friend to every citizen of, of Queens, and she'll especially be a friend to our community right here. I just become increasingly comfortable, as I put it, not to get to know Elizabeth and the whole concept of her becoming a Queens Borough President. So I thank David Wright for helping to coordinate the, today's meeting. I especially, of course, thank Elizabeth and her staff for taking the time to be here, and hopefully uh, the time that we spend here now will be productive. I do have a class shortly, if Elizabeth is aware of that, and I have to, number one, just do some last minute prep for that, and then I have to get over to the class. I want to welcome, I see you all here right now, is Rabbi Chaim Schwartz uh, of the uh, Queens Matter of Adam, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz uh, of uh, Yeshiva of the Time is with us as well.
and the young Israel of Kew Garden Hills for opening up your center. Of course, we did rent it, but for being a good friend since we first met, since we first had the opportunity to sit down, uh, David Reich had introduced us. Back at a time where I was unsure if I was going to put a bid together to run for Queensborough president, but we talked about what was important to the Orthodox community here in Kew Garden Hills, about public safety, transportation, access uh, to a borough president, given the opportunity that I was to represent, and uh, has been kind and welcoming ever since. He's a true pillar here in Kew Garden Hills, and a religious leader that many look to in Queens and New York City. So please join me in giving a round of applause to our host. Um, David, I can't believe it's been about 15 years, but I want to thank you for your friendship and your help in organizing today's breakfast and being a true mentor and someone I can turn to uh, for advice when it comes to tough political decisions. I uh, really appreciate you working hard for this today and, and helping on my campaign. I want to acknowledge a lot of other leaders who have joined us here today. Uh, certainly uh, the rabbis who are here, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz from the VAD, Rabbi Chaim Schwartz from uh, the RSA, um, Rabbi Kasaba from uh, Rigo Park. Uh, did I miss any other rabbis who are here? Uh, from the Jewish link, Yaakov Cheryl, uh, Sandy Popman, who is a district leader in the community. Uh, we also have Cynthia Zaliski, who runs Queens Jewish Community Council. Thank you for being here. And Jeff Gottlieb, who is uh, also a Democratic uh, political leader in the community. I'd like to take you back to my bio first so you understand a little bit about my roots and where I come from. I was born and raised in Elmhurst, Queens, not too far from here, and I was born the 14th of 15 children. My parents uh, were very dedicated to, of course, our family, but the greater community. And uh, my father was involved at the time when he passed away at only uh, 53 years old, young, young man, uh, he was a city council member. And uh, my mother then was left to raise most of us all on her own. And so she did a good job, but we were able to have each other and the greater community, which helped in uh, my upbringing. And like, unlike a lot of politicians, I didn't go study law at first. I just followed my passions in school. I studied art, and I graduated from college with a degree in art restoration. I had the opportunity of working on some of the greatest landmarks in New York City. Uh, if you remember, in 1999, there was a terrible fire that uh, really almost nearly destroyed the historic Central Synagogue. I had the distinct honor of working with a team of artists to redo the motifs on the wall and the, the stars of David on the ceiling. And it was almost like an empty canvas when we came into the synagogue and we left it uh, looking almost as beautiful and distinguished as it looked the day it was built. Um, and with many other landmarks, but it was through my involvement in the work that I did as a union member and then going back to school and studying architecture and urban planning that I got involved in politics. And so I ran in a district that never ever had a Democrat elected before, and never had a woman either. And, and in, in 2008, we made history in that district when I was elected. I'm running for Queensborough president because Queens does not get its fair share. And often we are like the forgotten borough, whether it's transportation, uh, the funding that we receive for libraries, cultural affairs, affordable housing, we're always getting much less than our population. Even so, the basic dollars that it takes to run the borough president's office, and we need a leader that's gonna stand up and fight for fairness. Now, more recently, Rabbi Schoenfeld and, and religious leaders have rightly spoken to me about their concerns uh, on bail reform. 
And so, you know, uh, with all the candidates running, certainly the leading candidates who will likely participate in the uh, televised debates, I am the only one who says that this new no cash bail needs significant reform. And I've called on the governor to do so, and he has promised, especially as it relates to hate crimes, uh, to give the judges greater discretion. We cannot afford to go backwards here, uh, certainly not in Queens, where unfortunately in, in recent months we've seen a significant rise in hate crimes. Throughout New York City, we've seen an increase in 63%. There's no room for hate anywhere in our city, and we must be tough on fighting crime, especially hate crimes. I promise my first action, given the opportunity to represent as the next Queensborough president, to put together uh, anti-Semitism anti task force. We, we would have uh, religious leaders not only from the Jewish community, but from communities throughout Queens, and also educational leaders and uh, nonprofit leaders to all work together to do what we can to build tolerance and stem this tide of hate. It's clear from conversations that I've had recently this morning and over the past couple of months that your community is scared. Uh, nobody should feel that way, whether they're uh, leaving their home to go to work, to go to pray, or just uh, even in their own homes. So we must do more as a community, and you have my commitment. The statistics truly speak the truth. I want you to know that I'm somebody who's visited Israel both as a politician for government roles and also as somebody who has been out of public service for the past two years, my first international trip uh, as a non-elected official uh, was for almost pleasure reasons and, and to study a bit more on my own, but I chose to go back to Israel. So I'm here to let you know how important it is for us to have a strong business and cultural relationship with Israel for both symbolic and practical reasons. Queens needs to build stronger ties with Israel. For example, Israeli companies are leading the technology revolution. And we've seen a good partnership started by Mayor Bloomberg with Cornell and Technion University. We should create more partnerships like that that will benefit Queens residents and make sure that our borough takes on a leading role with education, uh, business, and government relations in Israel. Um, so you have my commitment to continue as a leader to proactively approach and identify the sectors that are creating jobs and opportunity and working together with Israel. Finally, I, I must say as a Democrat, and I'm proud to be a Democrat, proud to be somebody who's dedicated her life to public service. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about my party and how there are some of us that are Democrats that don't understand how important it is to have a strong relationship with Israel. So know that not only with my time spent in Israel, that I will remain committed and be a steadfast advocate of Israel. When I was in the council, I supported local Jewish nonprofit organizations. And it is the nonprofit organizations that are truly doing the day to day groundwork in keeping our community strong. Uh, I know, as mentioned, Cynthia Zaliski, uh, we were working together years ago before I was even in the city council on education and job opportunity, opportunity programs for new Americans and. Uh, we continued that relationship when I was in the council, and I look forward to doing so, given the opportunity to represent. Uh, Hazak is another, I see some board members from Hazak here. Uh, we worked together when I was in the council. And uh, and also Habit Hakim uh, with Rabbi Nisinov, who's not here, but who is somebody I have a strong relationship with as well. So no, I know the importance 
of keeping our local community nonprofits well funded. And it's something the borough president's office gets funding to do. Uh, so before I open up for discussion, I just want to thank everybody again for, for being here this morning, especially Rabbi Schoenfeld and David Reich. And um, know that this special election is upon us. It's only a few weeks away. Uh, eight weeks from Tuesday, March 24th. The turnout is supposed to be uh, expected to be low naturally because it's not a regular election day. Every vote truly matters. And so I'm building a borough-wide support for, from Kew Garden Hills to Bayside to Rockaway and throughout. And know that no one, no one out of my opponents has worked harder uh, to win this election, and I don't think anyone will work harder in the next eight weeks. So thank you again for being here. I really, really appreciate you giving me the time to get to know me better, and I'd love to answer any questions anyone has. Alan Turner. Now, Alan just walked in from a vacation. But I know Alan has invited some friends and had a house party, on, a Hanukkah house party. Right it was very helpful towards the campaign. special election march. It is just till the end of the year. I will be petitioning to be a Democrat on the ballot in the primaries, our next primaries, because by law we have to run in the general election this year as well. So uh, that petitioning will start next month and it will go on simultaneously with this campaign. And uh, it is my hope to, to, to win big in March and that there's no real competition uh, after that. But there could be five elections in a year and a half's time. There could, there could be a, a, this March one, the June election, a November election, and then next year when every city office is up, the borough president will have to run again, and that will be when a, a full four-year term can happen. I just want to say one thing. Please silence your phones, and if you do want to ask a question, please stand up so people can hear you. The city spends hundreds of billions of dollars dealing with the homeless situation. It would seem that if the city would just build housing and put these homeless people into these apartments, the problem would be solved. Do you see any resolution within Queens for the homeless problem instead of just filling up all our hotels, spending hundreds of dollars a night to put these people in hotels? The hotels don't want them and the neighborhoods around the hotels don't want them. What do you see as the resolution to the homeless problem here in Queens? Thank you for that question, Robert Schwartz. Um, well, what I can say is I do know that Mayor de Blasio will no longer be the mayor come 2022. And I've challenged him on his failed homeless policies. Uh, I, when you mentioned this, uh, how nobody wants a homeless shelter in their neighborhood and there's a lot of fights and resistance, I think of a project that is proposed for the district that I once represented. And that's taking an old manufacturing building and currently, right now, it's under construction to become a homeless shelter that nobody in the neighborhood wants. Uh, but it's an M1 zone location. A borough president has the ability to rezone areas of land, not just you know one parcel, but many parcels together. I, I didn't talk much about my transportation project, but I have spoken to Rabbi Schwartz about it. There are a number of railroads not close to here, but not too far, that are just moving freight. And I believe, and, and one of those, it was in the district that I represented, where they're proposing a homeless shelter, and also where uh, a recent 
large yeshiva was built recent within the past 10 years during the time that I was in the council. And that, that means just that we need to look at those types of areas of land that are zoned M1 right now and rezone them for residential to build real affordable housing, permanent housing. Homelessness, homelessness is out of control. Uh, there are only a few people getting rich. Some of them are the mayor's friends. Uh, they buy these buildings and they rent the rooms out to the city for what you would pay. We're, we're paying the price of luxury housing for one family or one individual, thousands a month. Queens, when you look at our affordable housing budget as it relates to the rest of the city, we receive less than 10% of HPD, Housing Preservation Development Agency's budget, and we're nearly 30% of the population. That's nothing new. This has been going on for generations, or generations of a lack in, of investment in affordable housing here. And many of our families are suffering by just doubling and tripling up. Our homelessness rate is about only about 6,000 people in our boroughs, a lot less than other boroughs. However, the mayor has been putting the families here in Queens, where we have about 10,000 homeless people living. And that's unfortunate because when somebody goes homeless, they really should be kept close to their home, kids in the school that they were in before they went homeless, and where people are more likely to have support. So I pledge to work with nonprofit organizations to build more true affordable housing and look at, since Queens is running out of space, look at those M1 areas next to the trains, that's potentially future trains with future passengers on them, and help build Queens more efficiently. So, so that was a, a long answer to a complicated question. What is your position on education, specifically in District 28, that has very large Jewish population is undergoing a diversification plan as a result of which middle schools might be disowned and kids might be forced to go to schools far from home. This is especially concerning for Jewish families on Fridays when the new commute will take over an hour instead of 10-15 minutes for families that choose to live near their neighborhood schools. What will you do at the Winsboro president about it before the plan is implemented? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important and timely question. Uh, the mayor has a plan to try to diversify as many community education council districts in the city as he can possibly do before he leaves office. He's done it in his own district in the areas where he lived, Carroll Gardens and Park Slope. The difference between the mayor's district and our District 28 is that we have zones. Our zones are protected by our community education councils. So the mayor and the Department of Education cannot do as they wish. They started a diversity plan that was supposed to be inclusionary and democratic. But they had what they wanted to do in mind set already before they started this process. So I believe that um, it has not been transparent and I don't support the mayor and, and the Department of Education. I support parents on both sides, in South Jamaica and in the Forest Hills area, because no parents want to have to put their kids on buses to get a better education. And there's nothing, I'm a, a parent whose, whose kids went to high school in District 28. Um, my two sons graduated from Forest Hills High School. And, um, and, and there are zones from my old district that are zoned in 28. In fact, I, I was able to help build a brand new school. One that is called Metropolitan High School. Forest Hills serves Glendale Forest Hills. And uh, one of those is a middle school called Mel's. And what I propose to do as the borough president, you know, given the opportunity, we have 12 middle schools, we need more. Forest Hills is overcrowded, and so is South Jamaica. We could use about 3,000 new classroom seats in that one district. Now, my old district was the most overcrowded when I got there, it's no longer overcrowded anymore. We built 6,000 classroom seats. It is the new schools that we could look to put diversity quotas in. There's those new schools, but not the ones that are currently uh, zoned for our families. Our families 
should not be denied access to their zone schools. That's my position, and it does. And we could fight the mayor on this because the community education councils have the control, and those councils are made up of nine people, two of which are appointed by the borough president, the others are elected from within the community and the schools. Okay. Um, sitting in the row right in front of you is a fellow like Steve Ruby. Steve lives in, in Agua Gardens. Uh, right, you know, we have a whole bunch of And next to him is this little sneaky corner. Aguilar is quite a size of a complex as it is, but it's about six stories high or something. And next to him, in the other corner there was this little sneaky corner, uh, a pharmacy, a, a, a uh, dry cleaners, a restaurant, you know, just mom and pop stores. And all of a sudden, he's finding out no input from the community. There's going to be an 11-story monstrosity that's that's there that's already going to ingest the resources that are being in construction. I don't know where they're going to park, what this is going to bring, blocking everybody's security. And when he complained to the local community board, they said, sorry, it's a done deal. And, 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 and we almost had a 40-story building going up near the police station. And, and uh, somehow or another, I'm not even sure what that's up to. And it was all done without any community input. How can we change that, that this that affects us, our well-being, how can we support get that input to City Hall to vote? Right, that's a very good question. I pledge that no rezoning will happen without community input. You could look at my prior work and no one could point to a development project that happened without community input. Uh, there are some of my opponents here who have run and not followed that course of large rezonings with not enough community input. Uh, so I'm you know, sorry to hear about local mom and pop businesses put out of business because of a big developer. Uh, small businesses are employing over 70% of Queens residents. We need to make sure that they remain a vital part of our borough. And, and my pledge is to make sure that we have community boards with uh, the leadership that is representative of the communities. Uh, so nothing should have happened without you knowing about it. And that's what I promise as borough president. So, jumping off of this, we, most of us live in attached homes in the area that are single family. The zoning is R1, which is one and two family home. What is going on is uh, a lot of illegal conversions for their basements to a second family. Uh, so, on my block, I have no parking anymore because of this two family changeover, the long majority of which is illegal. Uh, how could we correct this, or can we correct this? I don't really want to hurt my neighbors, and because the houses are so expensive, they need the second income to be able to afford the house that they bought. They basically overextend and need the income from the bank. What do we do? We need more affordable housing. Uh, nobody sh should live in a basement. And it's one thing uh, for extended families, because they have access to all floors. Uh, but we, for the own safety, need to do our best to minimize the number of illegal conversions. And when I was a council member, I chaired the fire committee where we would see all too often incidents happening because of living conditions such as that. It's not only dangerous for people who live there, it's dangerous for our first responders as well. I believe the best way to, to fight illegal conversions is by building real housing. Sorry, I'm leave anybody. Again, my personal thanks to you. Let's give a round of applause again. So following up on the community, um, what would you look for in the members that you appoint Everybody's appointed by the borough president to the community board. What would you look for in the members? And do you think it's important to have members on the board with different points of view, even if they might disagree with the borough president? Absolutely. I, I believe in democracy, and I haven't met anyone who agreed with me 100% of the time. So I would think that 
I don't, it only be natural to put people on the community board who may not agree with me. What I would look for is that that person has first the community's best interest at heart. And then I would look for ties to the community that are strong. Examples of community service, uh, and making sure definitely that that person lives in the community and or has a business in the community. All right, well thanks, and it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Oh, one more. So when it comes to this uh, campaign for affordable housing, and at the same time keeping our neighborhoods the way we like them. I know the huge piece of land in Queens is Sunnyside Yards. So how can we make sure that it gets developed with affordability in mind, but at the same time traffic concerns, overcrowding concerns, school concerns? Because I know Sunnyside Yards will come up. So Sunnyside Yards is about 300 odd acres. Yeah, huge. It's pretty big, right? Yeah. Um, and it sits on the E-Train. It's not far from Court Square, mm -hmm. Hunter's Point, 7 Train. Those two trains are active. Yeah, There's not a whole lot of room on those two trains, especially there. So my plan is to look at areas that you don't have to put a deck on. It costs almost a million dollars just to put a deck over one square acre. How is that cost efficient when you have areas that I alluded to before along the Lower Montauk Branch, you can find hundreds of acres that you don't have to deck over. All you have to do is put the train on that line. And then you can ease the overcrowding on the E train and the 7 train and build more affordable housing all along that line at a lower cost. And when we're always trying to balance budgets, it's important to be fiscally responsible. So I don't know that that developing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to developing Sunnyside Yards, but I don't. I wouldn't say it was my first priority. I think that Long Island City has gotten more attention than the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming. And if, if you'd like to talk to me uh, individually, I'm, I'm here on this stage for as long as anyone would like to stay.